Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yes, yeah, somebody wants me. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. I'm your host, Corey Heights. And on today's episode, we have Coach Tom Espinoza, of Putnam Science Academy in Putnam, Connecticut. Uh, Tom's a head basketball boys coach there. He's been there since 2007. And uh, during that time, he's won a national prep school championship both in 2018 and 2020. Uh, Going back, Tom played four years at Worcester State University. He coached at Putnam High School, Marianapolis Prep, before starting the Putnam Science Program. And during that time, he has placed over 100 players, D1, including uh, one in the NBA. And we'll get to all that. So, Tom, thank you much. Thank you very much for joining the program today. Yeah, no, I appreciate you asking me to uh, jump on. I appreciate it. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, tell us, uh, starting out about Putnam Science uh, as a school, as a culture, uh, give, us, give us your elevator pitch on why kids should come there. Well, you know, we're very unique, and I know you you visited a couple of times, right? You've been here yep. two, three times, you know, so, you know, especially in New England, a lot of prep schools are, you know, out in the country, kind of isolated. Um, we're very different. You know, we're located in a little neighborhood. Our town is fantastic, the town of Putnam. It's about 9,000 people. Uh, we don't have the biggest campus, but, you know, you can walk off campus. You know, you can leave campus. You walk right down the street. And, and there's everything you want, a little downtown, you know, restaurants and pizza places and, uh, you know, uh, grocery stores and Walgreens, you name it. You, you can get everything right down the street. So a lot of prep schools in New England, you can't do that, you know, because, you know, you're out in the woods and you just walk, walk, walk. <laughs> so, so, you know, we're very different. We're unique. It's, our school is an old Catholic school. It was built in the 1950s. Um, and then it was open. Like I said, it was an all girls Catholic school. And I believe it went co-ed and then I believe it closed like in the mid seventies. And then uh, this building sat here for like 25 years. No one used it. It just sat here. And then, uh, you know, our original owners in 2002 uh, bought the school and they opened it up as uh, Putnam Science Academy in 2002, 2003 was the first year. So, uh, and then, you know, we had a good run with them, with our original owners. Um, And then, in 2000, and I want to say 15, we went through a little scare. Our numbers were dropping. And, um, you know, all of a sudden they announced they were closing the school at the end of, you know, the 2015 school year. Um, and then we had our previous owner now, you know, he, he came in, saved the school, bought it. And, you know, now we've been building it back up since the last five, six years. Yeah. Now you going back when you left Marianapolis to want to start a program at Putnam. Did you envision that you wanted it to be uh, potentially competing for a national championship? Or what what was your initial thoughts on why you wanted to start the program from scratch? Yeah, so it was kind of fun. So I actually, I started working here. And so when I graduated from college, I got hired at Putnam High School. Mm -hmm. And I was the health teacher. So I was teaching and I was coaching there. And then they had budget cuts. I got cut. Uh, My position was cut. And at the same time, the school opened up. It was just a part-time position, a uh, phys ed position. So I, I came over and I was teaching phys ed and I was doing some other things, you know, trying just to, you know, make, you know, make it work. Um, and then I started working over at Marianapolis with Dave Vitale. And now you, I, I know you know Andrew Vitale, the current coach of Marianapolis Prep. So his father, you know, coached before Andrew. And Dave Vitale was my high school coach mm-hmm. for four years. And we have a great relationship. So when I got out of college and, you know, I, I, I coached at Putnam and then my position got cut, you know, Dave just got hired at Marianapolis and said, hey, Tom, you know, come on over. I could use you. So I jumped over to Marianapolis. And that's when I first saw, you know, kind of what prep school basketball was all about. And Dave was just kind of starting it out, too. Marianapolis was really low at that time. And then Dave really turned it into, you know, really quickly a, a powerhouse you know back then i think it was class a class b and they were class b and they were competing with like uh tillman was loaded back then you know and uh st mark's 
Um, and those are the teams that he was competing with. And, uh, you know, we had, you know, we, we had a ton of division one players and we were really successful. So that's kind of where I saw it at first, you know, and then my school. So we were just starting out in 2002, the first year we opened up, we had 18 kids in the school. And then year two at Putnam Science, we had about 40 kids and then we're, we were building it, but it was mostly the owners were Turkish. So it was 90% of the kids were Turkish, you know, coming from Turkey or Turkish American or whatever. Um, and so, you know, basketball, I know, you know, don't get me wrong, Turkey's, they have a lot of good basketball players, but the kids we were getting were really low, you know, low level. They weren't basketball players. So, you know, at first I thought, you know, I was, I was coaching, I was working at Putnam Science, but then coaching at Marianapolis. So I was learning a lot through Dave. So finally I was like, you know what, I, I kind of, I want to start this basketball program, you know, and then they, they put me on full time now at Putnam Science. So to answer your question, did I ever think I would really compete, you know, at some point compete for a national title? Not really. I, I was like, you know, I, I, it was, a, you know, it was like a wildest dream for me to be able to do something like that. Because uh, you've been here, you know, the challenges that we have is, you know, our facilities and, you know, again, it's, it's, it's an old Catholic school, you know, I think we've done a lot and we've upgraded a lot and we do the best we can, but, you know, you know, I mean, I, I'm honest and I tell this to recruits all the time, you know, we're not IMG, we're not Montverde and Brewster, like, we, you know, we can't compete with them, you know, facility wise and stuff, right. and they have. And um, so, but yeah, I mean, it was a dream. I, I you know, I just got, you know, I, I wanted to get it going. And I remember our first recruit, Rondell Mouget, he was a seven footer, he ended up going to Pacific. He was my first division one player. So I had a seven footer playing with all these little Turkish guys and, you know, we're in a real low level league and, and we just got it, you know, we, we kind of got it started. And my personal goal was, all right, I just want to get better every year. Let's just get better every year. Let's take baby steps. And, you know, that's kind of what we did year two, you know, I ended up bringing in three recruits and then year three, we were, I was able to bring in five guys, you know, you know, help financially. And, but it was tough to bring in, you know, those, you know, one or three or five players. Cause a lot of them were, you know, you know, international kids or city kids or whatever the case was. And they're coming up here and it, the culture was just different, you know, it was mostly, you know, Turkish kids and it was an all boys school at the time. And so it was, it was, we had a, our challenges, but, uh, but it's been a fun ride and I still, that's still what I have in my mind is let's just get better every year. And, and starting with those early players, how are you getting them? Are you actively recruiting or your contacts calling you? Is Dave helping you? Like, cause obviously it takes time to build all these contacts you have now, right? These just didn't happen yeah. overnight. So how did that start in the beginning of you getting first a seven foot or then these other recruits? Yeah, so so I, I didn't when I was at Worcester State, I did an internship at the University of Connecticut and Tom Moore. Tom Moore, sure. bef before I got to Worcester State, he was the head coach at Worcester State. That was Tom Moore's first job. He was the head coach at Worcester State, and then he left to go to UConn. So I went to Worcester State. I, I never had Tom Moore, but my the coach I had a, had a good relationship, played for Coach Moore. So to, to answer your question, um, so Coach Moore introduced me to his assistant coaches, which I kind of knew they were Worcester guys. Eric Eaton, who's at St. Michael's now, head coach of St. Michael's, and Sean Doherty, who's the head coach at Hamden Hall. So those were my guys. And so those two, honestly, it was, it was Eric Eaton and Sean Doherty, you know, helped me get in contact with Brock Erickson, who was coaching junior college basketball at the time. But they helped me get uh, Rondell Mouget, and then moving forward, it was really those two guys that helped me get my early recruits, probably my first nine, 10, 12 guys. Gotcha. So it's all about connections. That's what it's all uh, about connections. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's what people, that's what kids like, uh, you know, ask a lot as well. How do I, how do I get in touch with this coach? And, you know, back in the old days, it was connections. Now, thankfully with technology, you can reach out to anyone in the country directly. Now you might reach out to coach K and not get through his uh, firewalls. But that's one of the advantages kids have nowadays. And I just think it's great because I'm guessing now, too, I'm assuming you and Tom will still send you a guy. Uh, Brock, does that oh, still yeah. happen? Oh, yeah, all these years later? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I just had basketball camp last week and Brock was a guest speaker. He mm -hmm. came over and, you know, so, uh, yeah, as you know, as time goes on, you hope your relationships build stronger. And, you know, we've been I've been lucky that, you know, I have some good relationships and good friends out there. Now, guys like me, coaches, we're, we're reaching out to you all year and saying, Tom, we've got a player, check him out. We think he might be a good fit for you. 
with all these players you have coming your way, how do you break down which ones you actually want to join your program? What are some characteristics they need to have? Uh, you know, I'll be honest with you, you know, and, and I say this a lot, you know, I, I'm not, we, we, and I know a lot of coaches say this, you got to be tough. You got to be a good kid. You got to be tough, but you know, we really believe in that. And, and I'll be honest with you, the kids that we're successful with, and I know we've talked and you, you know, help me got players and, you know, we've done all that, but you know, we don't get the top 50 kids. Usually, you know, we don't get, you know, we, we don't get a lot of high major kids right away. So the kids that we go after are the kids that have a chip on their shoulder. Like they have something to prove. Like, so we love those division two kids that want to be a division one player or a low major that wants to be a mid major or mid major, be a high major. Those are the kids that we honestly go after. Those are the kids that we recruit. And those are the kids that we're successful with, you know, and uh, you know, and at the end of the day, you know, we, we want kids, probably the biggest thing is we want kids that want to be here, you know, and, um, when, when I talk to, you know, players and, and student athletes and their parents and, you know, I'm 100% honest and, I, you know, and I'm not saying that no one else is, but I just, I really focus on the negatives about being here. You know, I, I give them how hard it's going to be here, what you expect, like, you know, and some of my assistant coaches, they always tell me after, like, Espo, what are you doing? We, we want this kid. You keep telling them how bad it is and this and that, you know, but I, I just, you know, at the end of the day, after when I give my spiel, and they still want to come, those are the kids that we want. You know, those are the kids that are like, you know what, they want to be here and they're going to buy in. And, you know, I think we'll be successful with these kids. So that, those are the kids that kind of, that we go after, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And then you also have a second team too now, correct? Correct. correct. Walk me through that. So if I'm a player and we're talking and you're saying, you know, Corey, you're going to be on our second team. What are the advantages or disadvantages of being on that roster versus the main prep roster? Yeah, so the second team, so, well, I can tell you that the, the positives is, you know, we recruit for two teams, and I tell that to all the kids. So we bring in about 25 players, you know, 12 on each team, 12, 13, whatever the case is. And we tell it, you know, but obviously, you know, some kids know that they're going to be on the top team, mm -hmm. you know. But that's how we do it. We just recruit. We say we have two teams and we recruit everybody. And honestly, you know, so we don't have it like, all right, we don't recruit. You're going to be on the second team. You're going to be on the first team. We recruit everybody. And then we don't have like a three-day tryout. Like we, we basically do it all together, the whole preseason together for six weeks. So when they get here Labor Day weekend until October 15th, we do our preseason together, you know, so we get up at six in the morning and we're going down to the track. We're doing agility and plyometrics, conditioning drills. It's all 25 kids. And then, you know, you know, obviously we have different lifting groups. We can't have that many in the gym, uh, but then we do all the skill work together. And then we play in front of the college coaches in the fall all together. So they basically, the kids have almost six weeks to prove, you know, what team, you know, they should be on, you know? So, um, and, and, and we're very proactive and I tell the parents, you know, especially the ones that I think definitely going to be on the second team. I'm, I'm honest with them. And I say, listen, we have, you know, all these kids coming in, you know, eight really high, you know, high level guards. You, you, your son is going to have a challenges to try, you know, to make this first team. And again, like I said before, I just, I, I'm honest. And again, like, you know, I tell kids and I tell parents, like, this might not be the place for you. You know, we recruit. Some some prep schools bring in four or five guys. You know, we bring in twenty five guys. So mm -hmm. it, it is my you know if you're not you know up for the challenge and you really really have to be mentally tough to come to Putnam Science Academy because you know as you know and everybody goes through ups and downs and if you're here you know and you could be great in September October November and all of a sudden December you're struggling and your cough you know your shots not falling your confidence going down you're not mentally tough enough to get up you know you can. You almost can get buried here. We just kind of take the next guy, you know, and we tell parents that. So this is, you really got to be mentally tough and understand where, you know, where you're coming to and what we do and how many guys we bring in. So, um, but it, you know, that, that second team is still pretty good. You know, I mean, like we do the best we can. Unfortunately, we can't get them into, you know, who Paul and some of the bigger tournaments, unfortunately, but we try to get them in the exposure events in New England that are good. You know, there's like the zero gravities and the basketball events. And, you know, they'll play close to 30 games. I would say probably 80, 90 percent of them are still college rules. They play 40 minute games. And um, and again, our big selling point is at the end of the day, you're playing in front of all these coaches for six weeks in the fall. You know, and, and we're lucky where we'll, you know, minus COVID year. 
you know, we could have 50 to 100 different college programs in our gym per week, you know, so um, so there's still a lot of advantages, you know, you know, but I can tell you who has the toughest job in our school is the head coach of that second team. because You know, he's got to he's got to deal with these kids where some kids still think they should be on the top team, you know, so um, but it's good. I mean, at the end of the day, you want to be on the top team and, you know, we do provide as much as we can for that second team. Um, but, uh, but, you know, you can't please everyone either. Yeah. Two questions on that follow-up. Do, do your second team, do you place those guys? Yeah. Yeah. We do, I think we do a pretty good job. You know, I mean, like this year we'll have a couple of low, I mean, a young uh, division one players on that team, you know, in a couple of years, they're, they're going to be a, one's a freshman, like a seven footer, one's going to be a six ten sophomore. So he, they'll probably be on that second team. And then I think the last two or three years we've had, I think two division two kids on on each each year, you know, and then a handful of division three players. So, you know, this this close to I would say, I would say an average seven, eight, nine guys go on and play college basketball, division two yeah. or division three. The name of the game of prep school basketball is uh, is getting placed. So whether in the first team or the second team, you know, th this is the conundrum I'm dealing with right now. The kid is he wants to be on the main team, and yep. I said you can do that, but you might play two minutes a game, or you can play in the second team and get 25 minutes a game, right? Yeah, and, and this is what I want to touch back on what you said earlier is tech, talk to me because I want people to know just how important the open gym period is for prep school players. And correct me if I'm wrong here, but other coaches I've talked to have said it's 95% of the recruiting happens during open gym because that's when the coaches are out. That's when they get to see everybody versus just five guys on the court during a season. So explain to me why uh, the open gym period is so important for your recruiting. Before I touch on that, I want to go back to what you just said, though. Like, it's, it's happened to me three times, like what you just said. A kid thinks he should be on the top team, wants to be on the top team. So we moved them up because of an injury or one kid wasn't working out. They lasted about a week because they, they didn't get off the bench and they wanted to go back and they went back down to the second team. Because like you said, it's doing you no good sitting on the bench or playing two minutes. You know, coaches want to see you play. And so it's happened a multiple times where – in our team they moved up to the top team and then they they chose to go back down to the second team to play so right but anyway but yeah so no i about the open you know the fall we say this all the time to our kids if it's uh if it's right or wrong the bottom line is the most the, the first five weeks where you're here at school could be the most important five weeks and, and and so we always stress to the kids like you better come in here in shape ready to go because you don't want to come in here You've never lifted a weight because right away we're in the weight room. You don't want to be sore after a week in open gyms. You're not shooting. And, you know, so, yeah, yeah it's, it's crucial. Unfortunately, it's changed a lot. I haven't been doing this that long, but I can see, you know, 13, 14 years ago. And now it's just different. Like coaches are not coming out as much during the season. You know, I mean, I remember 10, 12 years ago, we'd have tons of coaches at our practices, you know, and it's just not the same for whatever reason. But the preseason, it, it, it's it's just crazy. It's crazy. And it, I agree. Um, and we tell our kids this all the time, right or wrong, the first five weeks are the most important part of the season. Right. And, and, and especially the kids that just come to New England, because, you know, first impressions are huge. And, you know, we have, you know, Adam thinking here and he's, you know, first time he's seeing them and, you know, he's rating them. And, you know, again, is it right or wrong? I don't know, but it's just, it's, it, it is the first five weeks. Right or wrong, not think about how many kids. I mean, that's the reason kids come to prep school, Tom, is for that open gym period because you there's no guarantee, obviously. Yeah. But you're going to get so many eyeballs and you're going to be playing against so many other top caliber players that there are high school kids across the country that would love that. Because think about it. But I give the example, and this might be beating a dead horse, but if I'm a college coach, I can fly to New England and see three open gyms a day. Or I can fly to a major American city, rent a car, fight traffic, maybe see one practice with maybe one college kid. So where's the bang for your buck? That's why I don't understand. I don't understand why, um, you know, every college program in America, every single one doesn't make an annual pilgrimage to New England in the fall. I mean, it, there's, I mean, Juco, absolutely. You can get bang for your buck there too for certain places, but uh, there's nothing better than the prep school world for the open gym period. And tell me this too, confirm or deny this. Kids have gotten scholarship offers based on one open gym performance. Well, absolutely, because what you yeah. just said, you know, we could have a Division two kid, and he, you know, we have a coach comes here, like a little major, 
and he has a great day, like you said, he's doing it against Division One players. So there's, you know what I mean? Like, so yes. oh, it's happened, yeah, like more times than I can count on my hands, you know? Absolutely. And it's funny you said that because, I mean, everything, a lot of what you're saying is what I say to recruits is crazy. But just like you said, I mean, we, we have a kid that comes to, you know, outside New England that we're trying to recruit. And I tell the parents, I say, listen, and – and there's a lot of high level prep schools in New England, but I say this is a special place, Putnam Science, because of our location. Like, just like what you said, uh, you know, like if Jim, Jim Bay, I'm from Syracuse, whatever, he wants to come see us work out, he can go to St. Thomas More first, watch them work out, drive 45 minutes north, watch us work out, you know, two hours later, keep going north to Worcester Academy, go east to St. Andrews, go 10 minutes to Woodstock Academy. Like we have so many college coaches, you know, like you said, they can hit, you know, three, four different schools in one day, you know, it's, it's, and, and I think that's why we have so much, so much traffic in here because of our location. We have so many other good prep schools so close to us. And confirm this too. You work with Jerry and Jock and those guys about timing, right? So, so Correct. you do make yeah, it yeah. as easy as possible for the coaches to hit all. all of yeah. Guys. I mean, it doesn't always work out, but we, we, we usually always talk about it. Absolutely. Gotcha. When a player commits to your school when he says i'm coming coach uh how do you start the recruiting let's say a kid commits in may all right high school senior and he's got d1 talent but just hasn't been seen what do you do in your conversation with him about getting him looked during the summer and talking to college coaches do you have a recruiting plan you discuss with these kids or how do you handle getting the word out about them yeah i mean it's it's funny and you know and I, it's not just us, trust me. And it's like the higher level prep schools. It's funny. One thing I've seen is when we get a kid committed and, you know, a kid commits and says, hey, going to Putnam Science Academy or, you know, St. Thomas More, or Brewster, Northfield, whatever, all of a sudden it changes their recruitment right away. Mm. In my opinion, I've seen it. And all of a sudden coaches are calling us and saying, hey, who's this kid you just signed? You know, like, can we get involved? Tell me more about him. So it, it's funny. I, I, you know, again, I just think, when they commit to a high level prep school in New England, it changes their recruitment right away, you know? And again, I don't know if that is right or wrong, but that's what I've seen, you know? And, you know, and, and we're just honest, like I said before, you know, you just got to keep working. And, um, and, and the most important thing we tell these kids is like, be ready to go when you get here in September, like, cause what we just talked about, how important it is those first five weeks, like be in shape, be ready to go. And, because I know AAU, you know, typically done end of July and then you have those four weeks, you know, before you, you know, head out to a prep school usually. And we just say, make sure you're, you know, you're ready to go, understand, you know, you need to be, you know, you bring your A game here Labor Day weekend when you move on. So, um, but yeah, we discussed that. But again, I, I think it's just, it's funny that because years ago we'd be, you know, we'd get a kid and then I would have to, you know, my assistants, we'd be calling and send mass emails to you know, American East, all the coaches in the American East, the, uh, you know, the Northeast conference, but now it's different. And we're lucky that now coaches are calling us. Mm, interesting. Okay. That's great. Um, now that you've got a lot of big time players coming through, are you guys figuring out how to discuss the new NIL options with them? Like, and what I mean by that, Tom, like, let's say you've got uh, three big time schools recruiting one of your big guys. Um, they're all going to get scholarships. They're all going to, you know, eventually get playing time. But are you now, have you discussed talking about the NIL and that's name, image, and likeness, that option to them and seeing potentially where they can get more money? You know, honestly, our, my, my staff, we've talked about it, but we haven't really <laughs> come up with a plan yet. We haven't, you know, dealt with that yet. But it's, it's crazy. It's, it's going to be wild, you know. I mean, I heard, I mean, college, we've talked to some college coaches and now, they're literally hiring coaches just to deal with getting at, you know, advertising for these kids. Like it's, it's crazy. Like they're going to hire a coach just to try to get sponsors for these kids. It's, it's wild, you know, but uh, yeah, I don't know what our plan is yet. I mean, uh, yeah, it, but we, no, I agree. I mean, it's something that needs to be talked about and uh, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting how this goes. Let me ask you this. Let's say uh, you've got a player you're advising and uh, he's got college A and college B, right? College A, he can make 100K uh, next year, right? And college B, he can make 200K. Yeah. I mean, I, we're talking Wild West here. This is uncharted territory. I'm just throwing this out, spitballing. Yeah. But like, 
if everything's equal, right? Coaching's great, facilities going to play. Like you kind of have to take the one with more money almost, right? Yeah, I mean, unless there's a big theory? difference. Yeah, unless the education's a big difference, you know. Let's say academic. it's not for this conversation. <laughs> let's say it's not. Yeah, I mean, no, I agree. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, obviously playing time and style of play, you got to consider as well. But if it's all pretty similar, at the end of the day, yeah, you can't walk away with you know hundred thousand dollars you know on the table but i wonder now i mean you've been on plenty of recruiting trips with kids where they go in they get the powerpoint presentation you know this is our style this is how we get kids to the nba et cetera. Et cetera. i wonder now if they're going to have multiple slides like okay you come here and you know bob sford's going to let you have an f-150 while you're here you know tommy's pizza you never have to pay to eat there uh, this investment firm is going to give you two thousand a month if you do five posts like i wonder now because I don't know. And here, here's the part I think is crazy, Tom, is I think the Ivy League, if there's a top 100 kid whose parents are middle class to where they, can't, if they won't get much financial aid and it doesn't make sense to take that over a scholarship, I think now Ivy League donors will come in and start saying, hey, we got you taken care of. Just come here, play here. You'll make it up to us during internships or after you graduate. So to me, like I, I, just, I just sit here and think of all these ideas. I'm like, wow, that could work. This could work. And I wonder too, Tom, like, tell me about this. Like if you've got a kid sitting next to a locker of another kid who's making 150 K more than you, but you're out playing them in practice, how's that going to help the team chemistry? <laughs> that is true. Yeah. I, I haven't really thought about that. You know, I mean, I, I, these coaches at the next level, they have their hands full with this, <sighs> I think, you know, um, it, it's going to be, like you said, like you said, it's just going to be wild. It's going to be wild. I mean, look, I mean, how much are those kids making at Memphis? Because FedEx, right? They're, that's like the headquarters, you know, and what they're paying, what's his name, $2 million or whatever. And uh, Who are they paying $2 million? That new, who's the guy that just signed? Um, oh. I recruit there. What's his name? Uh, Jalen uh, Duran or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's getting yeah. $2 million? Yeah, I believe FedEx. Yeah. <sighs> See, and yeah. guess what? Even yeah. like my dad, when he was in uh, getting recruited in college, he was getting recruited by West Virginia, Kentucky, and Houston Baptist. And Houston Baptist is like, what are you talking? Why would they recruit you? He goes, well, they were oil guys. And this is late 60s. And they flew him and my grandfather down on a private jet to Houston. Now, no one heard of Houston Baptist then. Then no one's heard of them now. But they offered my grandfather's a farmer, brand new combine. They offered my dad a Cadillac. And my grandfather's like, it's a pretty good deal, Mike. And my dad's like, <laughs> yeah, it is a good deal. But like, I'm not coming to Houston, Texas to play for a school that has no tradition. Yeah. Uh, but that was happening illegally back then. But now Houston Baptist still is a D1 program. And I guarantee you there's big time alum yep. that are going to say, let's make a splash. Let's get these cats in here and let's yep. give them a great, a great incentive. So to me, I think it's, it's just going to be a potential arms race, Tom. Oh yeah. I agree. I agree. Like I said before, I mean, they're going to be hiring people full time just to deal with this. You know? it's, yeah. yeah. Anyway, we'll see. We talk in a year from now. Be a lot <laughs> yeah. like just like last year, we were talking, having a conversation like this. Like, well, let's see how the year happens with COVID, and now yeah. we're yeah. on the other side of it. And it was it's a weird year, but I think next year at this time, it's going to be interesting to do kind of an after action report and see how this NIL stuff all turns out and how people are going to get smart with it and evolve with it. So. Anyway, that's for you to uh, advise yeah, your yeah. players on. <laughs> uh, so you've, you've coached some top 100 players in the past. What, what's the benefit of coaching a player of that talent? What's the with challenges? Uh, I mean, the benefits, I mean, um, I mean, obviously, it's he's a good player, you know, helps you win. But also, you know, kind of brings you to that next level. Like, what you know, Hamadou Diallo and Mamadou Diar, what those guys did for us. I mean, they kind of, we were just kind of climbing at that time and they just put us to the next level where, you know, we got invited to Hoop Hall and City of Palms. All of a sudden we're getting invited to these big time tournaments, which we couldn't get in before, you know, and all of a sudden now, you know, we're, we're paying for all our uniforms, everything. And now we have, you know, some sponsors coming in and now, you know, we have Under Armour or Adidas now, you know what I mean? So they help, you know, we're getting practice shirts and shoes and, you know, so you know, um, again, I say this all the time, right or wrong, I don't know, but like, it, it was it was pretty cool. And those guys, when Hamadou was, you know, taken off and, you know, we saw the benefits for sure, you know? So, uh, yeah, you know, but again, you, and you know, I always say this about Hamadou, what, it, it's amazing what these kids go through. Like, I remember Hamadou, he was 16, 17 years old, right? So we'd have a game here. And I remember looking around in the game, you know, after the game, 
after the game, we'd have, you know, all these top coaches here, all these, you know, some of the best coaches in the country here recruiting them. But then we'd have, you know, expressions here, rents, you know, mass route, all these top AAU programs recruiting them. And then we'd have Adidas representative under armor, you know, the, the, you know, the, 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 you know, the, all the shoe deal guys. And it, it was just crazy what this kid, 16, 17 years old had to do with, deal with after the game, after the game, he's talking to high major colleges, you know, Adidas reps and you know, under armor. And then all these AU programs, you know, it was, it's just, you know, people don't realize, I don't think, I mean, I know when you're in the business, you understand it, but a lot of guys, you know, outside, they don't understand what these kids go through. And Bahamadou always stayed grounded, you know, and I, I give him so much credit, you know, I mean, he had his, sometimes his issues on the core and this and that, um, but what he went through, how, how, you know, mature he was, it was, it was really remarkable to see, you know, and uh, I just don't think people realize what some of these kids go through and, and what we just talked about, how it's even going to get worse now, you know, it's just amazing. Amazing. What did he possess Hamadou that made him uh, an eventual NBA player? Uh, I mean, he grew when we first got him, he was six, two, six, three. And then when he left, he was more six, six. But obviously, you know, his athletic ability was off the charts, off the charts. And he had, you know, he, like you said, uh, you know, the kids that we recruit, he had that chip on his shoulder big time, you know, because when we got him, he had zero offers. And then the first couple of months, yeah, I remember his first offer, I think it was Fearfield. Fearfield and Quimpiac were like the first two. Um, and then everyone else obviously came in later. But he always played with a chip on his shoulder. Like, he was angry. Um, and, he, you know, he played hard. And... Uh, you know, but his athletic ability was just off the charts. So, you know, obviously, and, and even still today, the big knock on him is his skill, you know, shooting the basketball, which he continues to work on. But, I mean, that's, you know, but he's worked at that. And, and I remember, again, how mature he was when he was 16, 17, when he was here. He, it, you know, blew my mind, you know, how, how much he cared about his body. Like, he was such a freak about eating and drinking what he put in his body, you know, for breakfast, lunch, dinner. I mean, you know, it was just remarkable at that, you know, you're a kid that at that age, I mean, you want to eat a cheeseburger and sure. pizza, but he wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't be eating that. You'd see me in a salad or, you know, turkey grinder, whatever the case was, but he always cared about his body and, um, and, and he was a hard worker and, he, you know, and his athletic ability and his chip on his shoulder, I knew he was going to be successful. Yeah. No. And he's with the Thunder now. Is that correct? No, he, uh, Pistons. He just signed a two year deal. He just finished his rookie contract. So he signed a two year deal with the Pistons. I think 10, 10, 10.5 million, two years. Good for him. So it's great. Yeah. Really happy for him. Yeah. Um, has that helped your with kids reaching out to you having an NBA guy now? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and Hamadou and, you know, he he's always been loyal to us again, you know, going back to who we are. You know, I mean, Hamadou was here for almost three years. So he was here, you know, junior year, senior year. And then at that point, I mean, you had all, all the, you know, prep schools wanting them, you know, like recruiting them, say, hey, look, you know, come here. We have, you know, this is better. This is better. That's better. But Hamadou stayed with us and he didn't have to, you know, he didn't have to. And he stayed with us for that post-grad year. And, uh, you know, we'll always remember that, you know, how loyal he was to us. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, if we call him up, we call him up all the time and say, Hey, can you call this recruit for us? Or wow. okay. can you do a video for us? And, you know, and, and like our, you know, we have like a midnight madness and he'll do a video for us, but he, he, you know, anytime we call him and to, to call a recruit potential kid, he, he, he gets it done just like that. So that means a lot to us. And, uh, yeah, that's the type of kid he is. Oh, that's great. That, that really, it's good to have that in your back pocket. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> of course, the yeah. school is. But the and schools you're going up, oh, I'm sorry. I said the schools you're going up against also has NBA alumni. Yeah, exactly, also exactly. Too, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we get a lot of kids from New York, and and you know, Hami was he was a king of New York for a couple of years, and so that really helps us too. That he's you know he's from New York, and we get the majority of our players, I would say, come from New York, so that helps as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, during COVID last year, did you change any? Uh, of your coaching techniques or did you come up with anything outside the box that you might not have done previously? Yeah. So pre yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, we preseason, you know, we always would live stream anyway, you know, um, but practices, you know, which I would never do, 
because you know you have parents and this and that. you know it's it's a, as you know it could be it could cause some problems but the one thing that i kind of thought it was important that we filmed all our practices you know so we didn't so you couldn't just go on and watch our practice you would have to you know obviously request it and then we would send you the link but we had so we we did every practice so coaches could see these kids you know um so that, that was a big thing. And then the one other thing that we did and my assistants, we all talked about this was, um, you know, after every uh, open gym or practice, we kind of did like a, a review, like a little scan report of the practice. And my assistant, Josh Gray, but did a, he, he was kind of in charge of this. He did an outstanding job. So, so say we'd have, you know, our, our fifth practice of the year, he would chart down like, you know, Boris had a great, you know, great practice, did this, did this. And, you know, you know, whoever a mama do did this, did this. And, you know, so then when a college coach would, you know, a week later say, Hey, how's Boris doing? We'd go back at our notes and we send him, you know, three of his best practices. Mm -hmm. And we had it in the notes with, you know, practice five, practice nine, practice 10, and we'd just send them to the, you know, the coaches that were showing interest. So that's one thing we did. So we, you know, we had all our practices available and we took notes for, you know, and see who did well and who didn't do well. So that was one big thing that we did. Gotcha. And now if, if the Delta variant takes off this year and, and schools disrupted the season, it sounds like you'll have everything ready to go because you did it last year. Correct. You know, and, and we were lucky, you know, um, you know, we have five programs here, two girls and three boys programs. So we played over 60 games and we didn't have one COVID issue. And I give credit to the other Connecticut schools you know, we kind of, you know, we, we, we talked, you know, we did a lot of talking and said, how can we make this work? And, you know, Jerry and Chilius at South Kent and, you know, and a couple other connected schools, you know, we, 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 you know, we figured it out and we played each other, you know, that was the bottom line. We didn't care where we played. We just did it. And I think, you know, you know, cause we couldn't leave the state of Connecticut at the time. So, you know, we, we like Canterbury school, we played Canterbury school, I think, yeah, two times we played Cheshire Academy two times. We usually wouldn't play them, you know, and I give them a lot of credit. They won, you know, they wanted to play us. We wanted to play them. It was all about the kids at that point. Yeah. You know, we needed games. We had, you know, we needed film. And so we just kind of put all that other stuff aside and said, let's just play and let's get this done. And I give, you know, like I said, I give all the other schools credit. You know, we just, we all just kind of brought it together and, and no egos, no nothing. And let's just play. And that's what we did. So, I think worst case, we might have to do that again. And, uh, you know, and all our schools are pretty isolated, you know, like, you know, we had a closed campus and all these other schools had closed campuses. And so we test every Wednesday, get the results Thursday. And then we play on the weekends, you know, we play Friday at their place. They would come here Saturday and then we do it all again the next week, test Wednesday, results Thursday, play a different school on the weekend. So, um, so yeah, like to answer your question, you know, we, we, you know, we were nervous. We didn't know how it was going to work, but we kind of had a good routine because everyone kind of bought into it and we're on the same page. And I think we, you know, I think we'll be ready if we have to do it again. Yeah. And of all States to not have to leave no better state for good competition than Connecticut yeah. <laughs> yeah. from yeah, top to bottom. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the NCAA transfer rule, Tom? Uh, you know, I'm not a big fan of it, to be honest. I think it's, you know, now it's now, you know, you're just recruiting, you know, I mean, I don't know. I got to be careful what I say. <laughs> so, but, but the bottom line is it's like, now it's like you can commit to a school. It really doesn't mean anything. Now all the schools are recruiting you, even though you're wearing a different uniform, you know what I mean? They might not be directly calling, you know, kids at wherever you want to say Providence college, you know, you, I guarantee though that kid is getting recruited already from a different school, you know, through whoever, you know, their AU coach or this or that, you know what I mean? It's just, I just feel like now it's, it's just a recruiting game 24 seven. Even if you get the kid, now you got to recruit him constantly just to stay with you. You know, now what if he's not playing the first, you know, first month, you know, he's not happy. And then I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of it. You know um, I think again, they're going to, you know, it's, it's just going to get wilder, <laughs> you know, it already is wild, but I don't know. It, it, it's tough. I mean, at the end of the day, these college coaches, uh, you, you got to at some point just let them coach and not, you know, deal with all this other, you know, garbage. And, uh, you know, I feel bad for some of these guys. It's, it's a tough, it's a tough business. 
Well, they've always said coaching is the easiest part of being a college educator. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's true. It's true. <laughs> hey, who's shown up for you as far as your uh, the players you've had at Putnam Science? Who's shown up and been the biggest surprise for you? Oh, ever? Like, yeah, because, you know, you're, you're seeing a lot of these kids just on videos. When they show oh, up on yeah. campus, you, you yeah. have no idea if they're going to be worse about what you thought or better. So who's been the yeah. biggest surprise? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a great question. We say it all. That's probably the best part of when they all move in. Because right. you think some kids you think are going to be really good. They're not as good as you thought. And then some kids you say are borderline or not, you know, probably going to struggle yet. And they're better than you thought. So that that's like the best, <laughs> you know. Um, that's a good question. I mean, there's a lot of kids. Because as you know, at the end of the day, these kids, are they're coming, you know, if they're, inter, you know, international or, you know, come from a small school. I mean, it, it's such a big adjustment. I mean, we, we've had kids from Arizona and California that have come here to the East Coast, and it was just such a huge adjustment for them. Like Malik Ondingo, I don't know if you remember him, but he, he came from Arizona. He was a 6'10 kid. He came, this was probably, I want to say, five years ago maybe. He came with us, and, you know, he was supposed to, you know, he was, there was a lot of hype on him. And he really, really struggled just how physical it was here, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, and he really struggled, but you know, it, it probably took him to like December, January, he finally figured it out. And then he was really good. He ended up going to Texas tech and, but it's just a huge adjustment period. And it happens every year, you know, like we had a kid from Russia that came this past year and the game was just so fast for him. And this kid was big and strong, but the games, you know, here is just so fast. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, a lot of kids struggle at first. I, I was in that. I would say, honestly, probably like 70, 80 percent of the kids that come to the Putnam Science Academy, they struggle because, you know, they haven't played, you know, at this level, you know. And and I know they do, you know, as you know, AAU is a little different from mm -hmm. organized basketball. You know what I mean? And, and it's just a big adjustment playing with, you know, four, four, seven footers on the floor, <laughs> you know, and it's just it's a big adjustment. And, and our philosophy here at Putnam Science Academy and, and we sell this all the time and, and, and we really stick with this is everything is earned here. We don't give you anything. Everything is earned. And we talked about before we have, we're lucky where we have probably, you know, 24 future college basketball players, not all division one, but at all different levels. And, you know, you, you got to bring it every day. You got to bring it every day. And that's 6 a.m. So that's the weight room. That's, you know, study hall. I mean, we, we hold these guys to a high, you know, a high standard, and, and, you know, some kids just can't hack it. They can't, you know, they, they struggle with it. And, uh, uh, but at the end of the day, you, you know, that's what college basketball is all about. You know what I mean? Like, so what, the, what these kids are showing, we say this all the time, like what you're going through here, you know, like doing your own laundry away from your family, your friends for the first time. And, you know, you gotta, you know, everything is earned. Nothing's going to be given to you. You got to bring it every day. And you take a day off all of a sudden your next game, your minutes are cut in half. Everything you're going through, you hear all the time at the college level, you know, with freshmen, oh, he's a freshman going through the ups and downs, you know, et cetera. You know, so when you go to college and it's you and three other incoming freshmen, it's four of you in that class, but those other three guys went from a normal high school to college, you know, you'll be this much more ahead of them because what they're going through, you've already done it at Fun Science, you know what I mean? Or, you know, not just us, but any prep school. Any prep know? school, so, yeah. You know, so it's it's such a huge advantage, but it, it – you know, it takes a huge adjustment for, like I said, majority of these kids, they don't realize it. And I don't care what level you come from. It's, as you know, it's just different here. I mean, our, our last two, two, I think it was the last two years are pretty much our whole roster with division one kids. We had like 14 division one kids in the past two years, you know, so it's, it's as close as college basketball as it gets without being college basketball. You know, it's the best way to prepare for the next level. Yeah. And that's and part of my pitch to families is exactly what you just said, you know, get that homesickness out of the way yep. at prep school. So when you get to a college campus, when all your other freshman teammates and classmates are transitioning, you're hitting the ground running. You don't have to worry about that transition. So um, you do, I think the day I was there to visit one of the days you had like four, seven footers just strolling around. <laughs> and, and it, yeah. it is a unique challenge uh, to coach, which I'm sure 99% of high school coaches would love to have that challenge, yeah. but what is that like? I mean, do you, are you getting those players because you can develop them and you have a history of it? Or what? how do you end up with four seven-footers in your program every year? So, I mean, I'll be honest with you. So, personally, what I recruit, what I love in our staff, we love guards and bigs. And I'll be honest, you know, again, I'll say it again, right or wrong, I don't know. But we don't go after a lot of wings. Like, you know, 
six, eight athletic wings that can't shoot the ball, can't, you know, aren't great rebounders. You know, we love bigs and guards. I'll play with like two, three point guards and then two seven footers, you know, like I just love guards and bigs. So, um, you know, so we've always loved bigs. We've, we've been lucky. We've gone, you know, a history of a lot of bigs that have moved on and played the next level. But our style of play, too, is, you know, we like to score, you know, we like to push and score and transition. And then if we don't score, you know, we don't really, you know, we don't have a motion offense. We have like 50, 60 quick hitters. And honestly, a lot of our quick hitters, our bigs touch the ball, you know, like we feature our bigs where, as you know, I mean, that's everyone's kind of gone away from that from the NBA down. Um, but I still believe in that. And, and we've been successful because we've been lucky. We've had some bigs that can score with their back to the basket. And um, so anyway, so when we're, re when we're recruiting a kid, I mean, we just send them film and film and say, look, watch number 55 this is a seven foot seven one kid Vlad who's going to Texas Tech from Russia watch him how many times he touches the ball in this game wait and we'll chart it before we send it and you know so I mean we literally we don't just say it but we we, we mean it and we do it like our bigs we feature our bigs we really do and honestly you know our, I don't think we've ever had a big being our leading scorer it's always been our you know a guard but you know, as you know, like the bigs just need to touch the ball. It just changes the game, you know, and, and, you know, our big, you, you got to keep the bigs happy, you know, they right. touch the ball, they get buckets. Now they're running up the floor faster and they're rebounding <laughs> harder. And, you know, they're setting better ball screens for you. And I, I believe in that too. And it's kind of like an old school mentality, but I think you got to keep the bigs happy and they got to touch the ball. And um, yeah, you know, we've always loved being big and I, you know, I mean, I know it's not a, uh, official stat, but I feel like we're one of the best and rebounders in the country every year in prep school basketball because we're huge. We're huge. You know, I remember in 2018, uh, you know, when we won the our first national championship, um, you know, our point guard, Kyle Lofton, was 6'4", who's killing it at Bonnie's. Our two guard was 6'6", Jose Perez, who just transferred from Marquette to Manhattan. Our three man was a cook, a cook who's at UConn, who's six nine. He's he could be the best shot blocker in the. Our four man was Josh Mbalo, who's six eight, six nine, who's killing it at Buffalo, and then Oshun Oshunier was six ten, six eleven, who's at Bonnie, who, who who's another one of the best shot blockers in the country. So we were six four, six six, six nine, six ten, you know, six eleven, whatever. Like we were huge, you know, and uh, but. And then the, the the game we won, we beat Northfield in the championship game. And Oshun Oshunier, our 6'10", 6 6'11", 6 big man, he was player of the game with 28 points. Mm. So, uh, you know, we just, yeah, you know, I, I think it's important to keep them happy and, and let them touch the ball. And, and you know, again, that's how we kind of, that's just kind of how it's been going. And that's how, you know, we sell it to our bigs, our recruits. And again, this year, you know, we're going to have, I think, four or five, not seven footers, but six ten, six eleven, seven two, seven foot. So we we're gonna have four or five guys close to seven foot this year. So we can keep it going. <laughs> Thanks for sharing yeah. that. Um, yeah. We're gonna finish up here with our lightning round and just a couple of quick quick hitters for you. Uh, what was the biggest win of your career? Biggest win? I I would say it was two. Can I say two? Sure. <laughs> the, the 2018 national championship is definitely one of them. I mean, because what we talked early on, you know, like my assistant, Josh Graham and I, he's been with me. He's my right hand man. We've been doing, you know, Josh, we've been doing it for together for whatever, 13 years. And I mean, that was a dream. We always, when we were getting better and better, it was still a dream. Like, could we ever do this? Could we ever win a national championship? And we did it. And it was something that was really special and I'll never forget but also one other game back in the day it was, uh, I want to say probably like 2012, we we're playing Winchington, which was, uh, you know, at that time it was class A, you know, which would have been triple A now, um, but they were really good. We we're playing in, um, it was a Hoop Mountain tournament at Marinopolis Prep. And we were just, you know, okay. We had about basically like four or five recruits and we knocked them off. And I remember kid had a, Winchington kid had a shot at the buzzer to win it. And one of our six, five guys came and pinned and blocked it at the buzzer. And I feel like that game just kind of changed everything for us. Like just changed our attitude, our mentality, like we can beat anybody. And we, we you know, it, it was just, it, that was one of the big wins I'll remember as well. Nice. How about the uh, best player you've ever coached against? And that's tough too. I know there's been a lot yeah, of them. Yeah, but... There's a lot. Tremont Waters, he was a nightmare. He was a night. <laughs> South Kent, I mean, no matter what you did, you, 
the ball screens, you want to, you know, double him. He splits you, you soft hedge. He's just pulling up. Like no matter what you, he was, he was a nightmare. He, he was a nightmare. Um, yeah. He's right up there with one of the best. And I'll be honest with you. This is another kind of like a sleeper posh Alexander. I don't know if you, you know, he's at St. John's. He was at OSL. I would say we Lutheran in the Bronx. We played him against him for three years. Honestly, he's probably the toughest kid uh, we've ever coached against. Like he could be a running back at Alabama, I mean, he's a sh- six foot, sh- strong guard, quick, and just he was a he he was just I've never played any, against anyone like him before. So I would say Traymar Waters and Posh Alexander. Okay, what are your hobbies when you're not coaching? Not coaching, uh, family. Uh, I love my family, my wife, my three kids. I do a lot. My kids are just getting into sports, so I'm doing all that. But I also I really enjoy golfing as well. Okay. Last but not least, what's your favorite movie of all time? Oh, wow. Favorite movie. Uh, favorite, I, I, man, I, I like Rudy. Rudy's a good movie. You know, I like Rudy. Uh, but yeah, I would say probably Rudy. Okay, yeah. good choice. Good classic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tom, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, it was great to hear your insight, especially uh, since you have such a big time program there with Putnam Science and you know, you've yeah. won national titles, you've sent kids every level and uh, you're I'm guessing, are you, you're probably not trying to go anywhere, right? You're going to keep continuing. No, no, I'm happy. Yeah. 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 yeah Cause it so, is your hometown too. So it's my hometown. Yeah. So yeah, I enjoy it here and uh, I've been lucky. I've worked with good people and uh, you know, from top to bottom. So I, I'm very fortunate. Well, perfect. Well guys, thanks for tuning in, Tom. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure. Glad to have you as a friend out there. And um, if you guys are interested in anything to do with prep school basketball, go to the website, prepathletics.com. Sign up for the newsletter. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'll be more than happy to get back to you. But this was another, another episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast with Coach Tom Espinoza from Putnam Science Academy. And we'll see you next week. Yeah, thanks a lot, Corey. I appreciate you having me. And thanks for all you do for these kids and helping them uh, you know, get placed in prep schools. Appreciate that, you know, everything that you do. Thanks so much. We appreciate it, Tom.